I think it might be helpful for us to get into the Genesis narrative a little bit. I mean, uh, many Muslims will not be familiar with it, uh, you know, um, reason or another. Uh, that's another topic. Um, even many Christians will not be familiar of it, and it could be something that they just kind of think of, uh, I mean, in light of stuff they hear from someone, maybe in church, maybe somewhere else, maybe on TikTok. So, I mean, um, the, the narrative, um, if we start with Genesis chapter 2, so the second chapter of the Bible, uh, it starts with this, <clears throat> at least the bit I'd like to discuss, starts with this intriguing um, line. So I'm uh, uh, gonna, going to read here from Genesis chapter 2, beginning verse 18. This is the Revised okay, Standard. The Revised Standard <laughs> translation, excuse me for my cough, uh, which, you know, you, you can correct um, if you see something that may not uh, explain the Hebrew very well. But uh, so Genesis 2, 18, um, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So maybe if we just start with that, I mean, what's going on there? Like, wh yeah. maybe how do the rabbis understand that? Like, why is it not good that man should be alone? Why does he need a helper? How did, what did they understand from that? So first, first, I, I wanted to, I know in some of your, your, one of your questions was about this word, the man, which gets, yeah. I think yeah. is translated uh, mostly in the English translations, we find the man, but that's not what the text actually says in Hebrew. Okay. And the, which, which, this is why his name is Adam, um, because the Hebrew is, he doesn't have a name, actually. What's, what I find fascinating about this is she has a name, but he actually doesn't have a name. Mm -hmm. And what he is, and I think in the translation, sometimes you'll see Adam as if as if he did have a first name, but he doesn't. The word is ha-adam, which in Hebrew means the human, or... Even the word, why is he called Adam? Because he comes from Adama, right? So it's really, which is earth. So he's really, the, I guess the most accurate translation would be, um, God saw that it wasn't good for the earth creature to be okay. alone. To because be alone. he is, I mean, a little earlier in chapter two, he's actually created from the dirt. From the earth. Yeah, he's created from the earth. So he's called the earth creature. And then it says, I will make him, and then fitting counterpart, is that the translation that you had? Um, helper yeah so the hebrew is azar kenegdo which is such a difficult phrase and one that i don't know that i've ever seen anything particularly satisfying to me in azar kenegdo in azar, azar is a helper but kenegdo means e either in front of you or somebody it's like a mama sort of in arabic like someone who's a front of you but also um facing you and and it, it also has the sense of against you. Hmm. So um, like not a yes man, right? Is right. this other, yeah, or woman, is the sort of this implied idea that it's a, it's, um, it's not good for a person to be alone, but it's also what's not good is, or what is better is for the person to have someone who challenges them a little bit is, is why, right? So that's a, that's one interpretation. You had this helper. I don't know. Did you have against him or a fitting helper? Um, a, a helper fit for him. Yeah. So the translation that I'm looking at, which is the JPS, the Jewish Publication Society, has fitting counterpart. And I think that the word counterpart also has that counter in there as well, right? This idea of Although counter. Could be down, downplaying the first Hebrew word, which I'll mispronounce, but which has something to do with help, right? The first one. Yeah, Azer which has to do with, with helping and more connecto. So what's going on there? Why does he need one? Yeah. Just, I, I don't know. But, you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But we do see that the very next thing that happens is that God makes animals. Mm -hmm. So it's bad. I mean, I think that after all of us, after COVID and Zooming and not being isolation, I think are intimately aware of how bad it is to be alone and to be, to have nothing and nobody. And that, what I think is interesting here is that having God is not enough to say that maybe blasphemously, but it's, it's not enough right. uh, to have God. And I'll, I don't know if you're going to, if this will be edited out, but when I first started teaching at the college, there was a professor who was a priest and I, we were talking about it. And he said something like, um, he's never, he never feels lonely because God is his, God is his boyfriend or something. 
Okay. Yeah, he said, God is my boyfriend. Yeah, is what he okay. said. He said, okay. God is my boyfriend. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and I thought, that's really interesting, but is God going to bring you soup when you're feeling sick? And, and, you know, things along those lines, like it's not good for people to be alone without people. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, that's because I in, think the, what, in the chapter two narrative, the animals like they're not they're not the answer. It, it doesn't No, it, in this narrative, they're not the answer. Right. He brings all the animals and all the birds and he brings it to go, to Adam, to this earth creature to see, as it says here, my Crello, what will he call it? What will he name it? Which is also an interesting thing. What do, what do you mean? What will you name it? And um, which in the Quran, uh, I mean. Sorry, I don't want to uh, interrupt you too much, which I'm already doing. But in the Quran, of course, it's God who uh, gives the names to Adam. But right. Genesis, uh, Adam himself gives. Right. Them. And I think the significant difference, right, that God and in the Quran, it's also perceived as like a way to show the angels that that Adam is the preferred creature because God gives him the secret information mm-hmm. that he doesn't give to the angels. But mm-hmm. here it's not there's no secret information that's coming from God. It's that God brings him these animals and says let's see what you call them and what does that mean let's see what you call them and i think there's some sort of implied like will he recognize them as being something that belongs with him or will he not recognize them um and and it says he just calls them he calls them by their names or he gives them names these animals and these birds and then in verse 21 it says there but no but he did he did not find a fitting counterpart for for this earth creature and in the way the hebrew is who is the pronoun he did not is it god did not or adam did not because it doesn't say adam did not find it says and to adam ule adam so for the earth creature ambiguity. he did not find. yeah so who's there's like a little ambiguity in the text there now if i can just ask about this contrast between quran and bible on um Adam naming all of the things, uh, even eventually the woman, I think uh, he gives, yeah. gives her the name uh, woman. Um, and then uh, whereas in the Quran, it's God tells Adam what the names of all things are. And I mean, just as you said, I think the point in the Quranic context in chapter two of the Quran is that, um, you know, Adam sort of demonstrates his superiority to the angels. Uh, but in a polemical context, people are kind of like, oh, look, you know, the Bible gives more agency to humans. Yes. Um, God sort of is empowering uh, Adam. You know, you have autonomy, whereas the Quran is just like God tells you everything and you just kind of obey and follow along. Uh, what do you think of that argument? Um, I, th- I think that there is a sense in the in the biblical story that there is a lot more agency for people. But I don't think the Quranic story is meant to take away the agency from okay. people i think there's okay. i think there's some other like you said this polemic going on there with this relationship between adam and god i, I mean I'm, i know i'm jumping ahead but i think what's fascinating about the quranic story is that adam does penance in the quranic story and he does not in the biblical story mm-hmm. there's no penance there mm-hmm. so um that tells us something about Adam in the Quran that he does have a lot of agency. He he recognizes his his misstep, his yeah. wrongdoing, yeah. and and he he apologizes and 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 asks for forgiveness, which yeah. we don't we don't find that in the Bible. So if you want to make a polemical statement, you could definitely point to that. Yeah, but I mean, what would you say um, to the idea that I mean, the Quran's just like a completely different kind of thing. Um, you know, even this account, which seems similar to Gen, so this account, meaning, you know, the stories about Adam uh, in the garden, um, in the Quran, you know, they look like Genesis two and three, but you know, the, the Quran is basically really religious, you know, it just wants to kind of drill into its audience that God is Lord, that humans should obey him. If they mess up, they should repent. And that's, it sort of carries that out through the Adam story. But the Genesis two and three account is really not religious. I mean, maybe it's the wrong word. It's really not religious or spiritual at all. It's just like a story. Uh, is that going? I don't, to... I don't think it's not religious at all. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think at all that that's what's going on. I think that there's a lot of um, a lot of messaging about about human nature, and and a lot of things that are stupendously ambiguous. I think on purpose that things are ambiguous and that 
I think this is a story in which the Bible does what it does best, which is that it purposely is ambiguous to invite you in to wrestle with the with the stuff. So I, I think that wrestling is inherently religious and inherently about what's the relationship. The readers or the yeah. interpreters. Yeah, it, it's it's pulling you in exactly the way you started off the conversation. What do we make of this? What what are we supposed to do about that? And and what is it what does it even mean to say who is this Ezra Connecto? And what we haven't mentioned also, Gabriel, is the fact that this is not the only creation story in Genesis, mm -hmm. which is that the the other creation story is a is a completely different story. The first the first chapter of the Bible. Right. The yeah. first chapter of the Bible, which we don't have Eve created out of Adam's body, and we mm -hmm. don't have um this whole naming of the animals and we don't have this whole counterpart help me whatever a situation going on there it's a, it's a different story and how do you what is going on with that right what are we supposed to understand from those two stories and does that story affect how we're supposed to read this story which i would say yes that that story affects how you're supposed to understand this story um and i think that, you know the rabbis also they they also would say like well, given what it says in the first story, how can we mm -hmm. understand this second story? What's going on there? Mm -hmm. so are they two different stories? And if they're two different stories, what's the point of those two different stories? Yes. Um, sorry, I look like you have a question. Uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, that's like a huge issue for, I mean, because Genesis is the first uh, book of the Bible, this is where people start. And, you know, they read Genesis 1 and it's just, I mean, I guess up to, is it, does that story sort of go up to the first few verses, Genesis 2, whatever. Uh, but, and then they read the next story in the garden and it's like, you know, so different. Um, yeah. I mean, part of the difference is what uh, people might call sort of like the mythical or the storytelling quality of the, the garden episode, uh, Genesis 2 and 3. I mean, and maybe the best, uh, example of that is uh, a talking snake. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, people, I think, are kind of, I don't, dulled to the shocking nature yeah. that you have an animal that's talking. Yeah. <laughs> He's not the only animal that talks in the Bible, which is interesting, but. I guess there's so. A, yeah, there's, there's a, a donkey. donkey. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's a donkey. Yeah. yeah a in donkey. the Quran, uh, ants, ants talk. Yeah. I love those ants. They're very <laughs> in cute. In the story of uh, Solomon. There's probably yeah. some others that I'm not thinking of right now, but definitely the ants talk. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so, I mean, what's going on here? Why is there a snake that's talking in the Quran? There's, it's not a snake, it's Satan, which maybe we can speak about the difference. But yeah, why do we have this talking snake? Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> why do we have a talking snake? And also, um, if you look at the description of the talking snake, um, it, he's he's called... In Hebrew, Arum, that he is the, it's often translated as the most crafty mm -hmm. or shrewdest. Mm -hmm. And, and he, if you look at his punishment in the Bible, in the, in the punishment is not what I find fascinating, not that the snake won't talk anymore because it's his talking that causes the problem, right? It's that the so snake. So that would be kind of an, a logical punishment would be. Yeah, a logical punishment problem. would be like, God comes in and says, snakes can't talk anymore because look what they do. But instead, what God says is they're going to lose their hands and feet. So it looks like this original snake was like some sort of lizard with with feet, hands and feet. And which you find in Islamic traditions, too, by the way, that bring in the snake. Anyway. Yeah. 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 His feet were longer than a camel or his legs were longer than a camel's. I think some of the. Yeah. So this, you know, he loses that. And he also like has to eat dust, like lick the dust, which is, I think, clearly an image of sort of like the tongue darting in and out of a, but it, he doesn't lose his power of speech okay so then we have to ask why that doesn't make any like it you would think that it should um and what does it mean to be that he's the most crafty and and why is he involved and this word a room again you know when you read it in english i, I find this a lot with the early stories of genesis that they're told as if they're children's stories that we're so used to them as you're saying that like we get these little children's stories and they're super complicated. Like they're not children's stories. Um, you know, the whole Noah, Noah's Ark, which is a children's story frequently, is also super complicated in the Bible. So one of the things that happens is what does it mean to say that this nachash nachash, which is the Hebrew word there, um for the is snake. A, yeah, for snake, mm -hmm. is a room. 
And the word arum is also the same word in Hebrew. It's the same consonants for arum, which is naked. Mm -hmm. So, and we know that there's a nakedness thing that happens in the story, right? That they discover that they're naked, mm -hmm. not that they discover that they're crafty. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the text is playing on these words, right? That that this snake, which is a room, leads to them understanding that they are a room, um, which I think is really an interesting parallel. But there's also a rabbinic text that says that the snake, this is kind of gross, but the snake um, was watching Adam and Eve in the garden who were naked and having sex with each other. And he developed a lust for, because the questions the rabbis are asking is, what does the snake get out of this? Why does he insert himself into the story? Yes. What is this craftiness? And is yes. this craftiness related to nakedness? Why is this the word that's used to describe him? So the idea was that he fell in lust with Eve, mm -hmm. say the rabbis, and he thought if he could cause a uh, wedge in this relationship, he could get Eve as well. Doesn't work, but that was his... <laughs> that's why he inserts himself yeah. into the story. But I think it's also maybe, I don't, not coincidental that a snake is, it's kind of a phallic image also, right? The, this idea of this snake. So the snake, which is naked and in love or in lust with Eve, that's trying to, that's watching them have sex and then wants to get involved. Wow. Uh, we yeah. are, yeah. This crazy. Is, it's a crazy, it's like. back the boundaries of. Uh, uh, exploring the Quran and the Bible. This is, yes. Yeah, that's why I feel like it's a, a lot. There's, yeah. there's, a, there's a lot going on in these in these stories. And... Now, I mean, is it okay if I jump in with a question about the Quran just to uh, for a point of comparison? Because, I mean, in some ways, the Quran seems to solve this problem by, um, well, first of all, the snake's not there at all. It's right. just, you know, uh, a shaitan. So, you know, Satan coming from the Hebrew word. For Satan, which we could, I guess, we go to maybe at some point. But I mean, the reason why Satan in the Quran, Quranic episodes on the garden, wants to cause trouble is because it, the man, I mean, it seems pretty clear. I don't think it's, ex no, it is said explicitly because there's this bit about a uh, uh, Anyway, the man has caused his downfall from heaven uh, when God commanded all the angels to bow down right. to the man. And obviously uh, the devil does not. And then he's cast out of the heaven or the highest heaven. So the whole thing is an act of revenge against, you know, the the causing causing Adam to slip from there, slip from the garden, I guess, uh, with the Arabic verb. Um, you know, it's an act of revenge. So it's kind of like, you know, it solves a problem or maybe uh, uh, makes less ambiguous what is ambiguous with the snake in Genesis. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that it, it's a, it gets a lot of that information from Christianity with the Quran. Yes. Um, yes. Has yeah, it's there you know, in like, early Christian texts. Yeah. Right. The whole replacement of the snake with with shaitan mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. um, not in the rabbinic texts or not in the biblical text. Right. Satan doesn't come into the Hebrew Bible into like way, way, way further yeah. on. But rab and, don't the rabbis. There's another name there. I'm not thinking of right now. That's connected with the devil somehow and identified with the snake in later Jewish texts. No. Um, Samuel or something. Samael, like right? Samael, right? Samael is um, it's, it's, he's supposed to be an angel. Okay. But um, yeah. you know, it's because Judaism goes through some changes, right? The Jewish text, like there's a lot of different groups. Mm -hmm. There's there's no real concept of which we do find in this story in the Quran and also in Christian sources. There's no real concept that that Satan was an angel who fell from heaven. That, sorry, let me back that up. I think that that story comes from Enoch from the Book of Enoch, which okay. is actually a Jewish source in okay. its very its core. Um, and so, so to say that Judaism doesn't have that concept is a little inaccurate because it's. I think it. I think it goes back, if I remember correctly, to three Enoch. Okay, but three Enoch is not accepted into the canonical um, Hebrew, Bible. Hebrew Bible or rabbinic text, oh, right? It's not, even in kind yeah. of like the library of authority right. of resources yeah. for the rabbi. Right. Okay. Like okay. three Enoch is a source that Jews don't know 
unless they're in academic Jewish studies, right? Got it's it. not yeah. it's not a source that's studied, and it doesn't in affect. The yeshiva, it. you're not reading Kriina. Okay. They don't even know about it, okay. right? Like it's not it's. Um, but I mean, to me, this is a really nice example, like the sort of clarity of the Quranic sequence of events, where first, you know, the devil is uh, cast out of heaven because of Adam and then seeks to have revenge on Adam in the garden, like it just kind of works and it's kind of sort of satisfying in a way. Um, whereas, you know, in the Bible, uh, you know, obviously the text, uh, at least the garden story um, was written. I don't know, maybe 1600 years or 1500 years earlier. So like it's whole other world or maybe that's not the right number. But anyway, centuries earlier, like you just have lots of ambiguity. And to me, yeah. that's kind of, I don't know if you agree with this, but it seems to me sort of paradigmatic or something else of a larger kind of thing, which is um, in Islamic intellectual tradition, there is kind of an emphasis on certainty, clarity. One thing leads to another. Uh, everything kind of works. And in Jewish, not only scholarship, but I think maybe spirituality, there's kind of just more comfort with ambiguity. Yeah. You know, let's talk about this. You think A, I think B, the other guy yeah. B. What I don't think it's, think it's even that? comfort. I think it's like relishing in the ambiguity. Okay. And um, I think that it's seen as a value that I don't know that that is true of Islamic intellectual. Um, wrestling in the same way right that this this idea that it op that it opens up a door for the conversation and i think this is actually i mean it's slightly off topic but i think this is actually a very important distinction between islam and judaism in the way that they each deal with their their texts which is that the actually dates back to my other project but the rabbinic understanding of the rabbinic project is that God purposely makes things ambiguous in the text to invite us into the conversation. Okay. And so, so the, so it's the, not really like a fault or a defect. Like No, it's yeah. on purpose, right? It's like, as if, you know, when you're teaching a class, you would do, I'm sure you would do this also. You put a text up on the board and then you'd say like, what do you see here? Let's talk about it. And that's sort of what God is doing. Like putting something up and saying like, I'm inviting you in to have this conversation with me and with each other and this wrestling and let's learn sort of the, the polyvalency, I guess, of the text is part of the important. And that idea that God is inviting us in, in partnership is sort of blasphemous for Islam. What do you mean that we are partners with God, right? That it's not, that's not an acceptable way to talk about God in Islam, that humans are partners with God. Right. Whereas in in Judaism, that's really the rabbinic yeah. way of of seeing of yeah. seeing the text. So the fact that it's ambiguous, I don't know that there's again, I, I I would say more that there's a relishing of the ambiguity more than there's a comfortable with it, right? That like that's part of the job of being a Jew is to is to read the text and figure it out. Right. And if right. if it came like on a platter here's what it means what are you going to do yeah right like, Excuse me. yeah what's left what's left for you right yeah. so i mean to me it's just yeah it's an important point that actually has larger lessons for us about how different uh judaism islam and christianity are in kind of like the experience of you know people in in those traditions and you know there's so much kind of like mushy I don't know, generalization and has been amplified by this notion of Abrahamic religions, plus just like, at least in the U.S., definitely at Notre Dame, but I think generally in the U.S., like this kind of like what you're supposed to say is we're all basically the same. And, you know, um, can I yeah. read a bit from the Quran now? Turn to the Quran. Is that OK? Sure. Uh, yeah. And then then just, first I'll, I'll ask you, I'm just going to read a bit from Quran 7 about the garden story. And then, you know, if you could just comment on like what you see here, I you know as someone who knows the Quran and the Bible well, um, what's going on in the Quran? What do you see as kind of like, I don't know, like purposeful or strategic differences from uh, the Genesis story? So this is Quran Al-Araf, Quran 7, starting in verse 20. Um, I'll just read the English here. But Satan whispered to them mm -hmm. to expose to them their nakedness. 
uh, it's the dual there, the them is dual, uh, which was invisible to them. He said, your Lord only prohibited you from this tree so that you do not become angels or become immortals. Next verse, and he swore to them, I am a sincere advisor to you. Next verse, so he lured them with deception, and when they tasted the tree, their nakedness became evident to them, and they began covering themselves with the leaves of the garden. And their Lord called out to them, did I not prohibit you from this tree and say to you that Satan is a sworn enemy to you? Next verse, they said, our Lord, we have sinned against ourselves. Unless you forgive us and have mercy on us, we will be of the losers. So what do I see in there? Um, so I, I see pieces that that um, are similar to what's in the Bible, and I see pieces that aren't similar to what's in the Bible. And so, you know, some of it echoes. I can you know, hear echoes, and then some of it are not echoing the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. Um, this idea about Satan whispering, um, uh, I think there are two, two of my favorite words in Arabic are chicken and whisper. I don't know why. But this this word waswasa, which is such a great onomatopoeia here, right? That it's it's what it sounds like when you're whispering, mm -hmm. um, is not at all. First of all, Satan is not in the Bible. It's it's that comes in from some other place, um, and he's not whispering in the Hebrew Bible. He's having an actual out conversation. There's no hiding what's going on here in so the Hebrew is that Bible. 